telling you. All right. Well, you have, you had something to dish about on your birthday. What was it that you said you, we were going to be discussing? Oh, the fact that you sent out a photo onto the Facebook <laughs> of me as a child asleep in the back seat with my Labrador. That's the best photo it's I have ever It's such a good photo. Taken. But I'm not going to lie. When I woke up, I was like, what the fuck is that? I'm like, where is that posted at? I'm like, oh, mom just posted it on her regular page. And then I realized people are liking Spattered's post. I'm like, we have a post today? <laughs> <laughs> I have been busy. Yes. If you guys are seeing social media stuff, that is all my mom's doing. She's our social media handler. I suck, but I try. You're doing better than me. Because I, I am just I like... Gonna say, <laughs> I get points for trying, and I'm enjoying reading some of this content that people put out there, and I'm like, oh, hell yeah, we'll like that one. <laughs> Ooh, you're creepy. I really like yours. Kate's like, what the hell are you liking over there, Mom? Everybody keeps going off, and I'm like, hey, I just like it. Well, I have social media on my phone, and I obviously, like, I pop in here and there, but for the most part, I'm like, nope, 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 nope. I just stay off of that shit because it's just too mentally, <clears throat> like, challenging Draining, at times. yeah. Well, it's doom scrolling. You get on and you're on there for hours and then you're like, God, I'm depressed. I'm like, I don't want to feel that way. This is why I watch little goaties and horses and miniature cows and laugh my ass off at it. Mm hmm Yeah. I avoid that other stuff. The cats, okay, she's down. Never mind. I mean, she's for the most the part, window. most of my feed on anything that I go on to is usually a lot of witch baits stuff so i'm like okay i'm good with this my little memes here and there once in a great while i get a xenomorph from a alien and i get all happy mm, you're so weird i'm weird i still say yeah it was me playing doom and doom 2 while you were in the baking oven <laughs> oh my god your dad come home what'd you do today well i got the house clean so i went upstairs and played doom what level are you at oh i'm done with doom i'm moving on to doom 2 like, yeah yeah. Well, we're continuing from mm. our last lovely session with David Parker Ray. We are finishing this bitch off today, yes? Yes, we are finishing recording, and right now it looks like it's going to be a three-part, but I am going to drop these last two parts consecutively, so you will get this part on one day, and then the other part will be ready tomorrow. Well, no, hang on. Part two will be ready, like, on Thursday, and then part three would be, like, Friday. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Because you're like, you, you could do this one day, and then this one will be ready tomorrow. I'm like, oh, you are not going to be ready tomorrow. They don't know what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> like, they do you? now. <laughs> they do now. It's Monday, but... <laughs> <laughs> Monday. I will as be drunk tell. as a skunk tonight, and then yeah. nursing a hangover tomorrow, then doing edits on Wednesday. <laughs> And I'm just going to go home and play golf and try to calm my ass down. All right. So before we get started, I do want to give our disclaimer. So while we understand that some individuals listen for the entertainment aspect of true crime, it's important to remember that these are real people with families and friends who may still be suffering from their loss. These stories are not meant to open old wounds, cause further emotional damage to those involved. We remind you, please be respectful. Do not dox or contact those involved with cases. The case discussed today on this podcast will be highly disturbing to some listeners, and listener discretion is advised. Where we left off was that we were going into the investigation that was going on with Jesse turning her father in for possible sex traffic allegations. He's back and forth between truth and consequences, Elephant View, and, like, Arizona right now. And down into El Paso, wasn't he, and all that area? He's all over yes. the southwest. He is yeah. everywhere right now. But he's kind of just, like, drifting around doing his own thing. So after the FBI had dropped their investigation into David Parker Ray due to of lack of I evidence. Did. Oh, yeah. Using his expertise in mechanics, he built himself the ultimate torture chamber, the likes of which would put some medieval and Spanish Inquisition dungeons to shame. Yep. So, David viewed himself as a sexual scientist, highly skilled and proficient in the art of pain. 
<laughs> oh my god. He called this location he built the toy box. And he'd take women he'd abduct into the small close quarters of a 22 foot long white cargo trailer. He wanted to study these women in close quarters and dish out immeasurable amounts of pain and suffering, and everything would be done to clinical perfection. This guy is... Yeah, messed up doesn't even begin. No, it doesn't even... No, no it doesn't even fucking touch on the subject. doesn't no. even begin to touch on the subject. So, no. at the time, he started compiling detailed instructions on how to best break down his victims mentally and physically, with everything being carefully documented, filmed, and then cataloged. Okay, now here's where my question comes in. With all this documentation and catalog cataloging, however you want to say it, was there ever a chance that this piece of shit was selling this crap out there? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And we'll get and, into that and, here in a and second. I was going to say, and do, does our alphabet boys ever follow through on that to find other little pieces of shit like him? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have, like, zero respect for the alphabet group, but, yeah, do they ever? So, as far as I could actually find, the FBI is still actively investigating with David Parker Ray because there's a lot to dig through. And Obviously, yeah. a lot of people. And we'll see how some of this does line up in part three and, like, come to actually fairly good conclusions. Oh, thank God. There's a little... Just... Yeah, it doesn't get much bigger than that. I'm sorry. I was going to say... <laughs> yeah. It's like a pin needle size I know. little ray of hope. <laughs> Fuck. The shit stain on the face of the planet. So he would also take souvenirs from each of his victims so he could relive the experience again and again. He also saw this as a business potential as well. He uh, saw this as go. an opportunity to make hardcore S&M bondage movies and sell uh, them to enthusiasts in the community. Uh -huh. And over the next few years, he'd make hundreds of pornographic videos, which he is alleged to have sold all over the world. Uh, I bet Pornhub loved his ass. Eh, Pornhub wasn't really a thing back then. Oh, I'm sure they've got a bunch of his stuff on file. There would later be reports of so-called snuff movies with women actually being murdered during bondage sessions. Oh, sweet baby Jesus. Inside of the trailer was a growing collection of sadomasochistic devices, equipment, literature, and personal writings, as well as drawings. One of which was a sign painted and displayed inside the entrance reading Satan's Den, oh. along with elaborate BDSM fantasies, which he would later execute in real life. Oh my god. This dude is a whole lot of... <sighs> so, some of the tools in the toolbox, or the toy box... Were well, it's his toolbox. So, it's his yeah. toolbox. And he was a tool, so. Yes. As Ash and Elena call him, he is a leather shoe. I'm like, that's that's a good descriptor. A rust, an old leather shoe. A worn yeah. leather shoe. Oh, no, I had That smells like but... Richard Harris's <laughs> breath. <laughs> Shmegma. Sh Shmegma. Oh, God, he is just, oh. God, and the more pictures I've seen of him, I'm just like, <laughs> All right, but some of the tools <clears throat> in the toy box included pulley systems, gurneys, weights, pliers, clamps, whips, scalpels, chains, and padlocks. Oh, my fucking God. There was also a glass cabinet that displayed a diorama of naked toy figurines engaged in bondage activities and other cabinets on the walls, which were lined with syringes, chemicals, different sized dildos, all orchestrated out of different materials. And we'll get into that here in a second. Oh. Electric cattle prods and other DIY devices that David had created himself to inflict pain. Now, one of these devices, according to Morbid's second covering, was like a wooden dildo 
Mm -hmm. That head had nails driven into it and then was melted down. Oh, he so needed to be sat on that one and spun around a few times. Mm. Oh. However, the peace state resistance to David was the remote-controlled gynecological chair, complete yeah. with stirrups. It was designed to freely slide back and forth along the six-foot-long track in the trailer. So he could put it wherever he wanted to, mm -hmm. do whatever he wanted to. Oh. It could also be positioned under a captive to keep them suspended in mid-air. You know, I gotta give him props for being creative. No, I don't God, give him any props. Fucker. Fucker. Well, I know. I'm just saying. Shit he thought up was... Wow. There were electrodes at the head and midsection, allowing David to give his victims electric shock therapy. Oh, of course. Yes, yeah. Don't forget that. Nearby, there was also a seven-foot-long coffin laying on its side in the toy box, complete with restraint hooks at either end and ventilation holes. Along with pieces of equipment nearby, neatly labeled vaginal stretcher, ankle spreader, and knee spreader. Oy. And according to Morbid, <sighs> some of these spreaders had barbs on the end or protrusions. So when the female would try to close her legs in response to being injured, she would get stabbed. Oh, how nice. Mm-hmm. So, finally, there was also a TV monitor in the trailer, so the captive could watch themselves being tortured, as well as a mirror on the ceiling, so if they looked away or tried to avoid the gaze of anyone in the trailer, they could still see everything that was happening. What a fucked up... Oh, God. So, he soundproofed the cargo trailer from top to bottom, so his victim's screams couldn't be heard, and for extra security, he installed a deadbolt lock with reinforced steel framing to it. So was this just his main, like, torture area, or was he expecting these poor women to actually live in this hellhole? So there's two different areas where torture can happen. It can happen inside the residence, right? or it can happen in the toy box, which I believe the area inside the residence he called the playroom. Yeah. So, usually after the victim was done in the toy box, she was either brought back into the residence, into the playroom, or taken care of, unfortunately. Oh, Jesus fuck. <sighs> now, in the toy box, there was also air conditioning, so if the captives were kept in there for extended periods of time... They didn't suffocate or possibly overheat. Oh, how fucking nice of him. As well as a portable toilet for them to use. I, I'm sorry, but my brain just went, why was he being so fucking nice? I thought he made him crap in a bucket after I listened to his stupid audio that he, the tape that we listened to on the first one. He did with a couple of them, but he does have a portable toilet. Wow. I'm pretty sure it's only because he might need it. Possibly. He was mm. in his 50s. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So my bitch. <laughs> How many times do you have to stop on a road trip because you have to go pee? Well, you know, why pass up the opportunity? I know, but how many times have you also said, we should just get a porta potty? Like, we'll oh, God. Toilet. Yeah. That's, <laughs> hello. Motorhome. So after this torture chamber was designed, he developed a solidified modus operandi. He attacked sex workers, junkies, or transient individuals who were unlikely to be reported missing or go to the cops with any of this information. Mm -hmm. He would kidnap them at knife point, blindfold them, and take them back to 513 Bass Road, where he would play them the introductory tape. Uh. On Friday, July 23rd of 1993, David left work early and went straight for the toy box. Over the course of the last week, 
he had diligently edited and updated his introductory message, which he was now planning to record on cassette. Yeah, that's a piece of work and then some. So I'm not going to read the whole thing because it would be a full episode in itself. If you're interested in listening to the whole thing or reading the transcript, I will have them both linked in my references. But I'm going to read the first couple parts. I would highly advise not going and listening to that, unless you're like already in a foul mood and you just want to act on it. Hello there, bitch. Are you comfortable right now? I doubt it. Wrists and ankles chained, gagged, probably blindfolded. You're disoriented and scared, too, I would imagine. Perfectly normal under the circumstances. For a little while, at least, you need to get your shit together and listen to this tape. It is very relevant to your situation. I am going to tell you in detail why you have been kidnapped, what's going to happen to you, and how long you'll be here. I don't know the details of your capture because this tape is being created on July 23rd of 1993 as a general advisory tape for future female captives. The information I'm going to give you is based on my experience dealing with captives over a period of several years. If at a future date there are any major changes in our procedures, the tape will be upgraded. Now, you're obviously here against your will, totally helpless, don't know where you're at, don't know what's going to happen to you, you're very scared and very pissed off. I'm sure you've already tried to get your wrists and ankles loose and no, you can't. Now you're just waiting to see what's going to happen next. You're probably thinking that you're going to be raped and you're fucking sure right about that. Our primary interest is what you've got between your legs. You'll be raped thoroughly and repeatedly in every hole you've got because basically you've been snatched and brought here for us to train and use as a sex slave. Sound kind of far out? Well, I suppose it is to the uninitiated, but we do it all the time. Yeah, I like how he says we, but you don't hear a whole lot about who the we is with him. So Which. as you go through on the advisory tape, he does talk about a lady friend. Mm -hmm. And once again, Morbid brought this up later. We'll bring it up now because... The girlfriend that he gets caught with isn't in the picture yet. She's nowhere around. So, he, yeah, he, we know he's basically had a few extras because the very first one involved did the same thing. So There's got to be a couple other females that are helping him with this, which is absolutely beyond disturbing. And obviously we know that there was a girl named Shirley that helped him in his teenage years mm -hmm. do some of this. It's very, ooh, my God, what the fuck? Yeah, exactly. But anyway, in 1994, David's fourth marriage ended with the woman from Phoenix, Arizona, and he took her name off the lease at the Bass property. To once again reinvent himself, David uh -huh. returned to using the surname Ray, and a sign was posted outside of his compound reading David P. Ray. David also abandoned his automotive service job at this time and started working as a welder and a mechanic for the Sierra Valley Construction Company. However, this job was too short-lived and he moved to Tucson, Arizona for a brief period of time working with the Sundant Construction Incorporation. Well, he really was everywhere, wasn't mm -hmm. he? He then heard about a vacancy in the New Mexico State Parks and Recreation Division, and he immediately applied for the job as a vehicular mechanic at Region 4 in Elephant Butte State Park, and he was accepted to the job. Well, of course, he had a stellar uh, rating as a mechanic. He's such a nice guy, and he's so incredibly handy. <laughs> he was given a Parks Department truck, complete with a CB radio and a state badge emblazoned on the side of it. And he proudly wore his uniform whenever he was given the opportunity. 
He'd later start carrying fake sheriff's badges and impersonating officers to entice victims into cooperation. Now, I do want to let you guys know that this is the early to late 90s that this, all, this is happening and before that, but huge thing nowadays, if you're feeling sketched out by an officer, there's no shame in calling the police department to confirm that you're actually talking with an officer or request that another one be dispatched to the scene. Or drive to the friggin' police department. That too. And refuse to get out of your car until somebody comes out of the department. Put mm -hmm. on your hazard lights yep. so they know that you see them mm -hmm. and drive to a well-lit area or even the police department if you need to. Exactly. And explain once you get there if they're like, hey, what the hell are you doing? It's like, I was just very worried about you. I wanted to make sure that I was safe and that you were safe, were safe. And honestly, any good police officer would understand that, especially if you're on the call with the radio to the dispatcher and the dispatcher is telling the officer, hey, this lady doesn't feel comfortable, she's going to a well-lit area, that officer should be fine with it. If he mm -hmm. doesn't, yeah, then he needs a little more education. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, eight years after turning her father into the FBI, Jesse Ray was closer with him than ever. There's and a, a lot of people questioned the strange hold that David had over his daughter, as Jesse now seemed to tolerate her father's unusual lifestyle and made herself scarce whenever he had female company. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 However, they both used to be fiercely independent. David had begun to lean on Jesse as emotional support, and he acted almost jealous of Jesse's long-term relationship with her girlfriend back in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yeah, it's not hinky. Friends even noticed that when Jesse would return to Albuquerque, David would almost every single time fall sick, become ill, and it would force Jesse to return back to Truth or Consequences and Elephant Butte to nurse him back to health. Oh, boy. Well, it doesn't surprise me because he has that controlling nature of him anyway. So mm -hmm. what he does with the poor women, why wouldn't he do it to his own daughter? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, on Saturday, September 30th of 1995, Jesse Ray spent the evening at a bar on Albuquerque's Central Avenue, which we're going to pause real quick and we're going to talk about that. That is a whole shitload of bad news there. Mm -hmm. So Central Avenue is known to many individuals and many seasoned officers as the war zone. It's a section of road in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where the historic Route 66 turns into Central. There is a lot of criminal activity that happens on the street. Ultimately, this is the area that you would imagine sketchy individuals to be hanging out, like gangs, murderers, rapists, drug dealers. Unfortunately, this is also where a lot of illicit sex workers highly solicit. Well, not only do they solicit, but they also go missing. Yes. Stay tuned for a future update on the Mesa, West Mesa, the bone collector, because, Jesus, as I drove through Albuquerque, I did not need to know that. Mm -hmm. We'll yeah. touch back on that one, because yeah. that is a huge case. Yeah. So, Jesse was spending the evening with a woman named Jill Troya, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that last name. I could not find duplicates of the pronunciation online. It was always something different. Mm-hmm. But at some point during the afternoon, the two began quarreling, attracting the attention of other customers, and later that evening, Jill disappeared without a trace. Holy shitballs. A few days later, a missing persons report would be officially made by Jill's mother, who lived in Michigan, stating that she last spoke to her daughter a week before her disappearance. Jesse was questioned about Jill's disappearance by Albuquerque police, but was later released. Well, let me take a guess. She took her home to meet Daddy. So, from what I've heard in other stories, and I discluded this because I wasn't sure if they were accurate or not, it sounds like after this fight that they had, Jesse may have called her father and left the scene. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I'm just going with the piece of shit he is, and I'm sure she isn't far behind him. That poor gal 
ended up most likely taking, taking a long drive to Elephant Butte. Future consequences. So it would be another five years before the investigation was reopened with Jesse Ray as the prime suspect for Jill's disappearance. Good. Now, at some point, Jesse moved to Elephant Butte Lake to live with her father in his trailer after splitting up with her girlfriend and spending some time in New, or in New Orleans working as a veterinary assistant, which, by the way, these people are animal lovers. Oh, fuck me, they are not. They're about she literally for... spent over a year, 17 months, trying to rehome a parrot. And I'm like, really? Really? What the fuck? And to say that they are animal lovers in, like, the book that I read or anything like that, I'm like, you are absolutely fucking shitting me because they did so much animal abuse with their fucking dogs. Well, I was going to say, come on, there is nothing about, there. There's they are so far from animal lovers, it's it's laughable that they're being praised as. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. like, this yeah. is, this is yeah. fucked. This that, is yeah. so well, fucked. You gotta put, you gotta put, it's once again, they were a good, hardworking couple. Oh, he was always so ready to help somebody with their car issues. He was a good neighbor never caused any problems it was always quiet over there well yeah but you guess what that's what happens when you have it soundproofed exactly and i i'm disgusted by the term animal lovers for these guys because uh, yeah, honestly really disgusted david would throw wild sex parties as we discussed a little bit about at the end at part one and at these parties, he would put on a show where he would actually bring in his German Shepherd more predominantly. There were three dogs that he had. But he would bring in the German Shepherd, and the woman would be bound in a position with, like, her butt up mm -hmm. so that the dog could actually rape her. Yes. That was discussed in his tape. How kind of him to let you know that he's going to do that with his beloved animals. Piece of fucking shit. Over the next couple months, Jesse became a well-known fixture around Truth or Consequences and Elephant Butte. One night, Jesse and her new group of friends welcomed in a new member, Kelly. And we're just going to leave her at that because I don't want to give out her last name, but she, she is out there still. Okay. Now, Kelly had moved from Kansas to Truth or Consequences in her early 20s with a boyfriend. But the two had since broken up, and she was getting back into the social swing of things. People liked Kelly from the start and soon named her Sassy for her bubbly personality and sense of fun. Over the next couple months, she became close friends with Jesse, who considered her a good friend and confident. In spring of 1996, Kelly was at Raymond's Lounge when she met a U.S. Marine named Patrick who was on leave from San Diego and was kind of just coming back home to see his parents. Now, Kelly had been through a couple of rough relationships prior to meeting Patrick, but these two hit it off right away and became very close. Now, there is one other girl in this mixture named Cassandra, and the best way to describe it is she was doing pick me girl behavior. Which I don't know if you know what that is because that's no, a newer term. Yeah, I was gonna say you're gonna have to explain that to this old <laughs> lady because I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> so, what we call pick me girls are the girls that basically, if they know that you're in a relationship, they don't care. They're going for your man. So she was very interested in Patrick and regularly like trying to squeeze into Kelly's spot. Yeah. Patrick and Kelly decided that they were so fed up with her antics that they decided they were going to get a matching pair of silver rings and stage a fake wedding, hoping that she would leave them the fuck alone. Uh, doubt it. He'll just be more of a challenge now. However, by the time the pretend wedding came around, Patrick actually popped the question. Aww. And the two got married for real at a small wedding reception. Well, that's kind of sweet. I don't know where it's going, because it's got to be bad if David Parker Ray's involved. Now, with Patrick being in the military and Kelly kind of being on her own in truth or consequences, they discussed this, but they were going to have 
themselves living with their parent, his parents for the time being until he could look for an affordable little place to permanently locate the two of two. Okay. So in the first week of being married, the two were fighting mostly over sex as Kelly suffered from an issue with her uterus that made intercourse very painful and she would refuse at times to make love with her husband. Okay. On July 25th, it was a Thursday morning and Kelly was up already dressed wearing white shorts, a t-shirt, her wedding ring, a watch, necklace, and an anklet according to her mother-in-law. She told her mother-in-law she was going to go see friends and would be back later that day. It would be another three days before she was seen again. Oh, no. Now, the group of friends went to the regular joints like Raymond's and eventually ended up over at the Blue Water Saloon around 8 p.m. and continued partying there for about an hour until most of the group had started to separate and go home, leaving Kelly there without a ride. Oh, no. Jesse offered yeah. to take Kelly back to her in-law's house on her motorcycle, telling her not to worry. But it was a little after midnight that Jesse announced that she was too drunk to drive at all on the way back to Truth or Consequences and suggested that they go to her father's for coffee first and to sober up. Oh, that's never a good idea. Kelly recalls that even though she had only had one beer that evening, she remembered feeling strangely, like, lightheaded on the way into Truth or Consequences and wondered if Cassandra had possibly spiked her drink as a part of her ongoing campaign to win over Patrick. Oh, sure. Let's blame Cassandra. Unless she probably could have. Who knows? If the, the, like you said, that town. When they arrived at David's trailer home, Jesse took Kelly to wait in the living room and disappeared into the back of the trailer, retrieving David, who came out with a pair of jeans on and a shirt. The two then sat down on either side of Kelly, and one of them, it's not disclosed which one, held a knife to her throat, and the other kneeled in front of her and handcuffed her. Oh, Jesus Christ. A spiked metal dog collar was placed around her neck and locked, Duct tape was placed over her mouth so she couldn't scream and over her eyes so she couldn't see. Mm. She was then led out of the trailer home and into the white cargo trailer about 30 feet away from the residence where Kelly lost consciousness. Oh, God, that poor girl. Once Kelly was inside the toy box, David began preparing her, quickly stripping her naked, placing her on the gynecological table, with stirrups. He then bound her by her thighs and ankles with nylon straps and attached chains that were secured to an elaborate pulley system overhead. He finally put a videotape in the VCR at the front of the toy box, which was linked to a wide-eyed camera overhead aimed directly at Kelly's body. He hit record and took some smelling salts from the overhead cabinet to bring Kelly back to consciousness. Of course. Now, when Kelly came to, David began to play the orientation tape he played for all of his victims as she laid there helplessly. She could smell the distinct scent of chloroform, which has a very ether and like sweet right. odor to it. Yep. At one point, the duct tape covering Kelly's eyes came loose, and she was able to peer a little bit underneath it, seeing David and the cabinets in the trailer that were displaying a variety of things along with items hanging from the walls. David then began assaulting Kelly with various different sized dildos. When one would fail to go in, he would grumble in frustration and grab another. Mm. Kelly notes how he was, like, trying to play doctor with her. Eventually, after about 30 minutes of this, David gets frustrated, gives up, and leaves the trailer, leaving Kelly there tied helplessly to the gynecological chair. And over the next three days, he would return to the toy box on at least five occasions and try this process again. Throughout the ordeal, David never once offered Kelly food or water, and the one time she asked to use the restroom, he 
made her use the portable potty in the toy box as he watched her relieve herself. Of course. Now, the only reason he had that there, but anywho. Now, when Kelly didn't show back up home on Thursday after going out with friends, Patrick became very worried and he went out to start looking for her, beginning at Raymond's Lounge, where he knew the group would probably be, and he was told that they possibly went down the street to go bowling at a bowling alley. Now, as Patrick is looking for Kelly, a thought pops into his head that she's run off to be with another man. And he starts drinking as a response because he's grieving possibly his wife running from him. <sighs> Going to their favorite spot by Elephant Butte Lake, where he inevitably drinks himself to sleep. Oh. The next morning, he woke up on the lakeside shore, very hungover, and made his way back to his parents, where his mom told him there was still no sign of Kelly. Patrick decided that it's closing in on the 24-hour mark. I need to file a a missing persons report. And let me stop you there. Isn't that a falsehood that you, you it, don't have to wait is. for 24 hours? Come you on. don't have to. You don't have to no. wait for 24 if hours. If something's hinkling in the back of your head, act on it mm -hmm. and harass them about it, too. Exactly, because there's no such thing as the 24-hour mark for a missing persons case. If you feel something is wrong, you... Push them on it. Don't let them turn you away and be like, oh, we'll just wait a couple of days. No. Well, I'm no. a police officer. I know what's right. No. You push that missing person's case. Yes, definitely. So he filed a missing person's report and then proceeded to drink more as he was starting to get worried sick. Now, here's the real pisser. Cassandra contacts him later that evening saying that she's got information about Kelly. And Patrick being worried, goes straight over. This girl tells him that she saw Kelly partying really hard the night before and suggests that Patrick get the marriage annulled. Well, of course, because she wants him. After this girl leaves, Patrick has a couple more drinks and goes back out to search for his wife, checking in with the police department every couple hours to see if they've found anything on their end. On Saturday morning, there was still no sign of Kelly, and Patrick bought a to-do guide to divorce as he was convinced Kelly had left him for another man, and he was going to annul the marriage on Sunday if Kelly did not return. On Sunday morning, around 8 a.m., David led Kelly out of the toy box into the blinding New Mexico sunlight. And as promised on his orientation tape, he had drugged Kelly with a mixture of phenobarbital and a substance of barbiturates. So she didn't remember a thing. Oh my god. I don't know which is worse. David also took Kelly's wedding ring, her watch, and jewelry as other souvenirs. Well, of course he did, because he's a piece of shit. The first thing Kelly remembers is that David stopped off at the Diamond Shamrock near Bass Road. He was smartly dressed in his ranger's uniform, grabbed himself a cup of coffee, drinking it without as much offering her a sip. Of course. He told her that he'd found her wandering down by the beach and that she was incoherent, barely conscious. He helped Kelly into his state-issued Ford Bronco and drove her to her in-law's residence in truth or consequences. So now he's going to look like, good God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, Patrick and Cassandra are inside the house, and Cassandra starts to look very apprehensive as a dazed-looking Kelly is being led through the front gate of the residence by David. Mm -hmm. Patrick is immediately furious and goes running out to confront Kelly. To his horror, she's barefoot, dirty, and still wearing the clothing she left in days earlier. Her hair is in braids, but it's unkept and full of sand. David was astonished with how Kelly looked as she usually had a compulsive cleanliness about her and was always showered and clean. Right. He also noted how she'd taken off her wedding ring along with all of her other jewelry and looked like she was under the influence of some sort of narcotic. He asked her where she had been for the last four days and Kelly told Patrick that she couldn't remember, to which Patrick's like, you don't remember a four-day block completely astonished and disbelieving. Well, of course. 
David then introduced himself to the family as Jesse's dad and that he'd found Kelly walking around the lakeside beach dehydrated and he rescued her as he'd been concerned for her welfare. Oh, fuck me. That he'd taken her to McDonald's, gotten her an iced tea before bringing her back over here because she was so dehydrated. Uh Uh-huh, sure. Now, Patrick demands the truth from Kelly regarding the last four days who's currently sobbing because she doesn't remember anything, and all she knows is that she is in crippling pain. Oh, poor girl. Patrick, unfortunately, doesn't believe a word that she says and goes storming back into the house, announcing that the marriage was over and he was getting an annulment. Asshole. When her new family closed the door on her, Kelly had very little choice other than to go back with David, who had offered her a ride to the damn site restaurant where her other friends would take care of her. Oh, she didn't go home with him, right? No. Thank God, no. Thank God. I'm just like, oh my God, out of the frying pan into the fucking fire. (sighs) Now, before we go forward with this timeline that we're on, we need to go back and talk about another key player in this case, one Dennis Roy Yancey. Oh, boy. Also known as Roy. So born on June 4th of 1971... Roy came from an extremely good family. His father was an officer, and his mother was a legal secretary. He was a hyperactive child who craved attention and would do anything he could to attract it. In his younger years, Roy's parents did divorce with his father moving to Galveston, Texas, and his mother staying in Truth or Consequences, where she adopted two more children, a little boy named Joshua and a little girl named Heather. Now... Roy was an average student, and he loved to play sports, and he was actually on the high school football team, but in the classroom, he could never settle down, concentrate, and it was a little much for his teachers, and they believed that he was undiagnosed with a type of attention deficit disorder. Okay. By the age of 16 years old, Roy had began to seek the acceptance of his fellow peers, which landed him in a very rough crowd where he would be experimenting with drugs and alcohol and joined a secret satanic cult. Okay. Trigger warning, animal abuse. Oh, Jesus, fuck, here we go again. By 1987, Roy and his fellow gang members had gone on a rampage around Sierra County, destroying local graveyards, poisoning dogs whose owners' surnames ended in R and then leaving the bodies of those dogs on their owner's front doorstep for them to find. Motherfucker. In October of 1987, Roy and other students were actually arrested for allegedly breaking into the home of their English teacher and leaving a dead dog's penis on the computer keyboard as a satanic warning. This year, Halloween was also canceled in Sierra County due to the ongoing rampage that this gang was doing. Oh, my God. A string of burglaries was also linked back to the cult members where guns and other weapons were taken from homes and hidden in the basement of one of these members' houses. As more victims of the cult came forward, a task force learned that apparently an older gentleman named David was the alleged leader. However, this individual wasn't caught at the time and... In the future, it's speculated by media that this was David Parker Ray. Yeah, slipped through their fingers again. Now, Roy and his friends did spend a lot of time in juvenile detention centers, and according to some reports from his teachers and other individuals around Roy at the time, it scared him fucking straight. And he came out better than when he went in. He graduated high school in 1989 and accepted an offer into the Navy where he spent four years serving his country and was honorably discharged, returning to Truth or Consequences in 1995. Yeah. Roy would tell his friends later that he was reintroduced to drugs after leaving the Navy and that this was a dark point in his life where he was using heroin, LSD, and mushrooms. And if you can see where this is going... Oh, yeah. He met and joined the crowd of one Jesse Ray. I'm going to say, you'd have to be a blind person not to see that coming at you. 
In late 1995, Roy and Jesse had befriended a 43-year-old homosexual man who was a loner from Florida. His name was Kenneth Lee Lane. Neighbors at Lane's apartment at the Old Rock House on West 2nd Street in Truth or Consequences stated that they regularly saw the two coming in and out. Mm-hmm. On one night on December 26th of 1995, Roy visited Kenneth and left sometime later with a wide smile on his face. Mm. On the morning of New Year's Day in 1996, police were called to Kenneth's apartment after a foul smell started coming through the next door heater. They broke into the residence to find the badly decomposed body in the front room. Wow, he just stepped his game up big time. The manner of death was ruled accidental. Oh my fucking God. With the cause being metallic poisoning after an autopsy revealed that he had an assortment of nuts and bolts in his stomach and a doorknob that had been shoved up his rectum. I'm at a loss for words. When the landlord came to clean up the apartment, he found blood spatter all over the walls of the front room, along with a drawing of a pentagram on a table with black candles. So he's back. To pause real quick, though. If you know anything about witchcraft. (laughs) I know. The pentacle, or as it's more commonly referred to by media, pentagram, Mm -hmm. is a cultural symbol of protection. And black is a color that usually is used to banish negative energy. However, you can throw spice with some black candles. You know, go to God bless. Do what you want to do. Just don't hurt people. Mm -hmm. Now, Uh. this death was investigated as a murder, but shifted to a suicide, then an accidental. And it would be 13 years before the case was reopened by New Mexico State Police with Roy Yancey as the prime suspect. How the fuck do you get from, where do they say, how did he suicide himself with all the blood stains and the fucking nuts and bolts and shit? And yeah, a lot up of ass. people were pissed off about this. Come on! That sounds, that <laughs> smells of cover-up. In early 1996, Jesse introduced Ray to her father, David, and the three <laughs> became very close friends. David Mm. usually stayed home while the other two went out drinking and joined them late at night for late night cruises on Elephant Butte Lake. Now, Mm. reportedly, David kept a stash of hardcore drugs at his home. Of course. Although the 55-year-old chain smoker did not even indulge in beer and basic alcohol. Well, you gotta keep your mind clear. So, it wasn't long before Roy was introduced and initiated into the sadomasochistic party scene that would happen at the Ray's home. And he became a willing participant. To which he'd later confide in friends that he'd been tied down at one of these parties and raped with a broom handle. Cool! Yes, there is a little justice. In summer of 1986, Roy began dating one Marie B. Parker, who was a 21-year-old mother who had problems with drugs and had been drifting around through life working as a sex worker in both Las Vegas, Nevada and Albuquerque, New Mexico. Marie belonged to a dysfunctional family, and her father walked out when she was a young girl, and her mother was running the local mailroom in Truth or Consequences. Marie was also reportedly molested by a close family member when she was a young Mm. girl, which led her to having frequent nightmares. Yeah, that'd do it. By the age of 14, she had a very strained relationship with her mother and ran away from home, accusing her mom of beating her, and was placed in a foster care family in Phelan, New Mexico. Hey, isn't that where David Mm -hmm. Parker raised from? Ooh, is... Her last name's Parker, and he adopted the name Parker. Are they related? I don't believe there's any relationship here, Mm. as far as blood goes. Okay. So, by 15, Marie was drifting from boyfriend to boyfriend and traveling around the National Circuit of County Fairs, working concession stands, which 
I know that we haven't talked about it here, but I do think it's important to discuss that we did talk about it a little bit on the West Mesa Bone Collector episode from Haunting Cases as well as the Sumter County Does. Those episodes will be disappearing on October 1st, but I do want to mention it here that state fairs are often a place where a lot of illicit sex work is done as well as other criminal operations that are done undercover, such as drug deals. And there's clowns. Yeah, that's never a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) By 17 and in 1982, Marie was in Las Vegas soliciting sex work for businessmen at the Four Queens Casino Hotel on the Strip under the alias of Angel Morrison. Mm -hmm. She became a well-known site at the location. But everything changed for Marie when she became pregnant at 19. She came home to her mother and true the consequences and gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. And two years later, she would become pregnant again from a man who would also walk away from her and her child, leaving her Mm. to bring up the two children alone. Oh, jeez. Marie was often depressed and would tell her mother that she was planning on committing suicide and would often break down in tears. She was scraping by, making a living at her family's mail room until it closed down, leaving her to fall back onto sex work to support herself. She made her way to Central Avenue in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where she was a regular scene at the Aztec Hotel. Oh, that poor thing. Marie was also becoming a regular at Raymond's Lounge, where she met one Jesse Ray, who introduced her to David and the rest of the crowd of friends. Mm -hmm. Within two months, she found herself living on the streets in a Geo Metro car with her two young daughters. She was addicted to crank, or also known methamphetamine. Right. People who were close with Marie said she virtually aged overnight, and many individuals around Truth or Consequences, especially young and older bachelors, wanted to help her break free from the drug scene and possibly marry her and get her stable. No. But she couldn't let go. Of course not. She first met Roy at Raymond's Lounge, and the two bonded almost instantaneously, sharing a passion for drugs and drinking. This relationship ultimately broke off when Marie tried to clean herself up and be better for her two young daughters. However, by spring of 1997, Marie's addiction took hold again. By June 30th, Marie was homeless and she phoned a friend named Julie who begged her to move into her house. But Marie refused and assured Julie that she'd be back on her feet again in no time and explained that a good friend... Jessie was going to let her stay in an army tent on her father's campsite by the beach at Elephant Butte Lake. Oh, no. Now, there are several things that occur between June 30th and July 4th, primarily being that the group had a lot of parties down at the beach, and unfortunately, during one of these parties, Marie is sexually assaulted by basically a stalker. Oh, no. Now... On July 2nd, Marie confides in friends about her sexual assault, and they file a report with the New Mexico State Police at around 1 p.m. At around 3 p.m., Marie is taken to the Sierra Vista Hospital and examined for injuries. At 5.30 p.m., officers speak with Jesse, who states that Marie looked messed up, but she hadn't seen her take any drugs that night or basically hadn't seen her been drinking. Like, this wasn't the way that she would usually be acting. When officers did go to interview this alleged offender, his home was empty. He wasn't there, neither were his parents. So they left him a message to come to the state police office and make a statement. Now, the July 4th weekend rolls around and Jesse is having a beach party, which went from Thursday all the way to the early hours of Saturday morning with fireworks, drinks, drugs, and booze. However, Soon after the fireworks subsided, David comes down to check on how things are going, and he's immediately pissed off because the beach is a disaster zone. It's a terrible mess, and things were left behind, and basically it's just a couple of people left there still. So he starts yelling at Jesse for jeopardizing his job with the state park system, and people note that this was the first time they had ever seen him mad in public. So it was about 5 o'clock on Saturday afternoon when Marie told her brother Tommy, who was staying with her at the campsite, that she was going to be going to the Blue Waters Saloon. 
in Elephant Butte to score some drugs and that she'd be back in two hours. She dropped her little brother off at her friend's house and then drove to the bar on State Road 195 in Warm Springs Boulevard, parking her blue Geo Metro in the lot outside and going into the establishment to meet with Jesse Ray as arranged. Where are the kids at at this time? So the kids are actually with a, another friend in the area, but they eventually do unfortunately go into state protection, and then her mother actually gets custody of them, I believe. Oh, thank God. I'm just I'm like, God, please tell me she isn't dragging those big... Itty bitty babies around. No, no. They are at a different mm-hmm. location. She didn't feel safe bringing them down to the beach with her, so they are staying <sighs> with... a fucking shocker. Another friend. All right. So, Jesse Ray arrived soon after in her father's white Dodge Ram Charger truck, to which mm-hmm. I had to go Google that because I'm like, oh, this doesn't sound right. No, it's Her, older. If it's it's a very charger, old yeah, truck. I'm like, okay, one, yeah. I've seen those around. I know what it looks like now. <laughs> you got panicky for Dodger. I did. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> when, I'm to make mom sell that truck. No, you are not. <laughs> so Roy was in the passenger seat, and Jesse went into the Blue Water Saloon to find Marie, who she brought back out to the truck, and the two got in, and Jesse took the wheel and drove off along I-25, soon turning off at exit 79 to Vista Memorial Garden Cemetery, where she told Marie they would be meeting the drug dealer. Jesse then got out of the truck and brandished a handgun at Marie. Marie obviously screamed because she was scared to death. Yeah. And then they handcuffed her. And as Mm. she's screaming, Jesse yells at Marie, shut up or I will kill you. Um, sorry, kill me. For placing the restrained Marie into the back of her father's truck and ordering Roy to ensure that she did not escape before turning back onto I-25 and heading back to 513 Bass Road. Mm -hmm. Marie was taken by Jesse to the toy box and according to testimony given by Roy, he went inside and joined his father who had been staying with the Rays and he was basically watching TV on the sofa. So him and his dad are just going to go chill in the fucking hellhole that is the trailer. Oh, so he involves his father with this. Did his father have any idea of what his son was up to? Or? I don't know. I uh, honestly do not know. I don't know. Considering that the tape, if you do listen to the audio, he alludes to the fact that a lot of his friends and neighbors know I what's would presume going on. Maybe. That's what I'm thinking. Just not not 100% there, but I'm just mm-hmm. going to go with the fact of, you know, you can't turn a blind eye on all that shit. Yeah, it's it's probably one of those scenarios that it's like, you know what? I see it. No, I don't. No. No, no I don't. No, no, no. I, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So yeah. for three days, Marie is kept in the toy box, and on Tuesday, July 8th, David and Jesse told Roy that they were done playing with her. And it was time for her to go. Around midnight, Roy entered the toy box with the rays and found Marie bound to the gynecological chair, or a cot, as he had mentioned, naked, blindfolded, and gagged. Jesse told Ray, you know what you're going to have to do. Mm, no. Roy put the rope around her neck and began to strangle Marie. He then placed a knee on her chest to try to speed up the process, and when she went limp and blue, he released the rope. Bastard. The three disposed of Marie's body under the cover of nightfall. Using a dark blanket, they wrapped her in and put her in the back of David's truck, driving to an undisclosed location and hurling her off the side of a ravine. Oh my god. They then yeah. followed down with shovels and proceeded to bury the body in the loose dirt. After they were finished, David threatened Roy that if he ever told a soul that he would be killed. Wow. Yeah, that other dude had to know. His, uh, whatever the fucking Roy's dad had to know. He had to know. Two days after Marie was abducted, her mother reported her missing, advising the sheriff to look at the Aztec Hotel as Marie performed sex work there. When they talked to her younger brother, Tommy, he told authorities that she had gone to the Blue Water Saloon for a drug deal. 
For the next two weeks, police did little to try to find Marie, and when an officer did eventually make their way to the Blue Water Saloon, her Geo Metro was still in the parking lot. However, the vehicle had been towed away before it could be searched. The officer handling Marie's sexual assault case was not notified of Marie's disappearance until July 19th, exactly two weeks after the report had been filed. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. Okay. And when the investigator discovered this, she took over the case due to truth or consequences limited jurisdiction. On November 24th of 1997, Marie's mother was checking her answering machine after a long trip out of town and found two messages where Marie had been apologizing and said that she was planning on committing suicide and just not to worry about her anymore. Do you think they actually harassed her and made her do that so it would take the light of discovery off of them? I'm not sure. They might have. That's just, you know threaten her within an inch of her life to do that. The information was given to the investigator and an APB was put out for Marie from the New Mexico State Criminal Division requesting help from other agencies in the nation wide alert on November 12th of 1997. Now, Marie Parker was born on March 12th of 1975. She has blonde hair, blue eyes, is approximately five foot and five inches tall, weighs 110 pounds. Identifying markers is that she has a scar on the inside of her wrist and a tattoo on her buttock. Her alias is Angel Morrison. There was a note for special attention to be given to Las Vegas agencies and surrounding areas that she had lived in before. Additionally, she had presumably been a suspect of murder in Las Vegas about seven years prior to her disappearance. She may be still using her alias. And the only reason I say this is because they did not find her body. It's just going on what the dipshit told them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're going to stop there for part two. And I will be back tomorrow with part three. Ah! Yay, me. Will we get to meet another troubled young woman who arrived in Truth or Consequences? Just days before Marie Parker's murder. Now, by troubled, are you talking Jesse kind of trouble or Marie kind of trouble? A little bit of both. Oh, fuck. I need a shot. <laughs> I also need a shot, so we're going to do that. But we're going to have a shot. We'll, we'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you again for listening to Spattered. Please make sure to follow the show on Facebook and Instagram at Spattered Podcast or on Twitter at Spattered Pod. Be sure to follow and rate the show on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you're watching on YouTube, please make sure to hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and smash that follow button. As always, if you have a story request, any questions, or are interested in sponsoring the show, please email me at spatteredpodcast at gmail.com. Spattered is a true crime podcast hosted by Caitlin Gardner. All the research and edits for this episode were done by Caitlin Gardner. All the music for the show comes from Lucio Cardenas, James Hansen, and Caitlin Gardner. A special thanks to our co-host, Joe Langardner. We'll see you next time. Stay safe out there.